this is JV here with Cosmic Scott and the Elite Mark Order, uh, some of which are, are listening in, in, um, in, the, in the background or listening in, in, on Discord in attendance. Um, tonight we're planning on reviewing Dynamite from January 11th, the big LA show. And then we're probably going to talk about some of the info going on with WWE. And don't forget, join our Discord and check out the website at EliteMarkOrder.com. All right. Figured if so, we have people who aren't in the Discord, might want to join us. Because we have some great conversations in there. And if you don't know what Discord is, because I know some of my friends probably don't that listen to this, um, go to Discord.com and just create an account and join the chat room. And you can always, you know... Give me a text message and I can send you a link and let you in. I was going to say, so, just text Jay. He'll walk you through everything. <laughs> right. Great. All right. So, you know, last night was a pretty big show, I think. Huge show. Lots of hype. Uh, we've been waiting for this show for weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, Pay-per-view quality matches. Three matches that, that could be on a pay-per-view. And then there was the big... Um, what was a mystery partner for a while. And so we'll have plenty to say about that. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, so the, the show, oh, I, go ahead. I, I was just going to say the show started off hot. They they went straight into to Moxley versus Adam Page. You, you got to love starting that that way. I mean, you know, they used to call it the curtain jerk position. But in AEW, opening the show is like an important step. Yeah, they wanted to uh, make sure if you if you started watching the show, you were going to keep watching after the first segment. Um, so, yeah, opening up with Hangman versus Moxley is a huge main event caliber match. As Gorilla used to say, it would be a main event in any arena in the world. It, it I mean, it's two former champions, two former AEW champions going at it tooth and nail. And yes, this would be a main event at any arena in you could name. This, this could main event Tokyo Dome. Could main event Tokyo Dome. And you're also looking at a big return of Hangman Page, who had been out for two months with a concussion. Uh, given to him by Mox. At the hands of, of Moxley, exactly. Yep. All right. Um, so uh, the, the thing for me is, like I said, I love starting off with a really powerful segment. And really, the Mox Page was brutal. It was just chops and punches and clotheslines. It was lariat season in this match. They hit so many lariats on each other, it's not even funny. And really, the big difference between a clothesline and a lariat, from what I understand, is follow-through. So when you hit a clothesline, you kind of, you know, you put a little into it, but your arm stays mainly, you know, perpendicular to your body. And in a lariat, it just goes all the way across. It's like you're literally punching using the crook of your arm. And these guys lariated the hell out of each other, including, you know, the, the hangman's finisher, which is the buckshot lariat. So he's a master of it. And the King Kong lariat, which put him out for two months. So this was a battle. This was two hard-hitting, heavy-handed they were men this was a man's fight this was very very strong style that's the way i would compare it and quite honestly going into it i did not think moxley was going to lose a lot of people thought it was going to be interference or this that and the other thing it was a clean loss and that's surprising i i did not in 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 our uh, in our voting section i i i picked mox i didn't go with page i thought sure he's coming back He's the younger guy. Mox, you know, does the honors. It makes sense to me. Plus the injury angle at the end. Play that up. And, you know, maybe he finally gets his vacation. But I did not see Adam Page winning this match. Not at all. What about I you? I did not either. I picked I picked Mox to uh Mox to win. Um or a draw, I thought would be more likely than Moxley losing. I mean, how many clean losses have we seen Moxley take since AEW started? This is his you know, second had... clean loss with no interference, nothing, just a clean pin. And the first one was Punk. Yeah, and he had a series of matches with Kenny Omega, too. Um, he lost the heavyweight title to Kenny. He um, That wasn't he clean. Lost... 
it was not clean, and he lost the uh, um, exploding barbed wire death match <laughs> to Kane, and, and that was not clean either. Because no, you had the Good Brothers out there. It was it was a three on one match, which kind of ruined that match. Worse than the dud explosions, in my opinion. Um, um, I never a, never a big fan of of a bunch of guys coming out to help someone win in those style matches because why didn't you just do it at the beginning of the match? So, yeah. Um, but anyhow, yeah, I, you know, Mox does not like taking a loss and it was, it was really surprising to me that Hangman kind of got his revenge and just straight up beat Moxley. Um, you know, he came in a house of fire two months off recovering mm -hmm. from a head injury and, he steamrolled them in a, in a hard-hitting, really stiff match that's uh, one you should definitely seek out if you, if you have not seen it yet. I mean, Paige kicked out of the paradigm shift. And the audience, I bit. I was like, are you kidding me? I popped. I was like, I cannot believe Paige just kicked out. So when, he, mm -hmm. when Mox got hit with the, uh, the buckshot, I thought, okay, he's going to kick out of the finisher. We're going to do the normal, you know, kick out of each other's finisher. Nope. Yeah, they've been uh, lightening up on the, the on any protection for the paradigm shift. Um, if you remember, a couple weeks ago, Takeshita kicked out of it on a one count. Yeah, I mean, again, this is this is leading up to potentially Mox finally taking his vacation. So, you know, Takeshita obviously he lost the match as he. I don't think he's really won on television yet, but he's been against everybody top tier. We'll get to him in a minute. Um, yeah, we will. <laughs> can't forget about Takeshita. Um, mm. But yeah, no, this was a, a fantastic match. Great way to start it off. And if if you were a casual AEW viewer, this should have locked you in for the rest of the show. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, it was an excellent match. One of the better matches that's been on TV. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, where do they go with this? I think Mox might take a couple weeks off for vacation and uh, he'll be back for the next pay-per-view. Uh, which is Revolution, probably, yeah. what, about two months away? Uh, and, I uh, think it's late February, so huh? I can check. But, yeah, um, I think he'll be back. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm hoping they have a lights out or a no DQ match because I'd just love to see those two go all out and beat the hell out of each other um, like in a 30-minute brawl. I think it would be awesome to see. So uh, looking forward to where they go with this matchup. I love the matchup. It's two of the top guys in the company, and, and both of them are, are two of the best in the business. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to what's what's to come. And March 5th is Revolution. So, yeah, about two months, right around. Yeah. I, I, again, I, I will never get tired of these two. They're, they're just top of the game, experts at their craft, and Moxley selling at the end with the, the injury angle. I loved it. I think there's so much more story for these two. And Hangman looking like he was so upset at himself for doing that. I mean, Hangman's got the, the plot lines, as always, the storylines of his internal conflict. So I just ate this up with a damn spoon. Yep, great stuff. Up next, we had Jungle Hook versus The Firm. Well, uh, before that, go. though, before okay. that, though, we had a really important segment, and I don't want to skip over it. It was completely unexpected. I heard no rumors about it. And it was the return of Adam Cole, baby. And Adam Cole. I, I am so glad to see that. First of all, yes, he was out with concussion for six plus months. I'm so glad to see him back. But at the same time, he's so over. He's a missing component. He's huge in that company. He's on the par with the Elite and Omega as far as audience re reaction and position on the card and we need that we need Cole to replace Moxley going out for a little while everything else just getting Cole back having that you know you just watch his entrance and the audience loves him so of course he comes back as a baby face he's gonna be a baby face he's probably gonna face MJF and I'm okay with that yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they're going to do with him. Is he going to go after the elite and team up with the kingdom? Um, you know, the two two ROH guys. Um, since you know, since his his partners, yeah, uh, Red Dragon. Mm -hmm. um, they're you know, they're they're neither of them are probably going to be back anytime soon. Um, so it'll it'll you know maybe Tony waits six months before 
you know, maybe when Kyle O'Reilly is ready to come back, six months, eight months, maybe it is is even another year before he he pits Adam Cole against the elite because he really wants that program to happen. It's a long way out though. Um, so I'm not sure. It'll be real interesting to see what they do with Cole. You kind of have to not go straight back to Omega versus Cole kind of let that simmer. They're doing the trio stuff, the interaction with him in the elite, it petered out because it didn't go anywhere because they were all doing different stuff. Just kind of let him be his own thing for a little bit do some gentle interactions obviously he's going to be on bte so we'll see where that goes but mm -hmm. uh you know i i just i want to see him do some programs alone o'reilly's going to be out he's not coming back anytime soon so he's got to stand on his own two feet which he can he's that good and then you know obviously fish he's never coming back <laughs> that is not yeah. happening yeah he kind of burned his bridges i don't know what the hell his problem was, um, I don't know. I really don't know what happened. Easy. Um, he was angling for the WWE return and well, they didn't want him either. Right. But I mean, you, you don't go and, and burn your bridge when you don't have an offer from the other company. Like, it, I mean, fish always struck me as a, um, a professional as, is a pretty smart guy. Um, I, I was impressed with the way he, carried himself during interviews, even if he wasn't the main focus, I would find myself watching Fish just because I just, I was entertained by him. I, I liked how he um, just reacted to what was going on. And I, I just, you know, when he came in, Tony used him a lot. And all of his matches were pretty solid. He didn't win most of them, but all of his matches, I thought he was a real pro. So the, the whole thing just just took me by surprise. I don't know what the hell Bobby Fish's problem is. So he, I know he, he was mad at Punk, but. He tried, well, first of all, he had the issue with Punk. He tried to get in the good graces with WWE, and then his Impact, they didn't even offer him a job. If Impact doesn't hire you, you fucked up somewhere. Right. Uh, and Kingbin from the audience says that his son knew Cole was coming back. It's funny because in, in, I was watching Paige Mox, and I'm like, Hangman came back from concussion. What happened to Adam Cole? And then the very next segment, he comes back. Uh, then he <laughs> mentions that Cole versus MJF after Revolution is his guess. I agree. Oh. I think it's probably going to be uh, after Revolution, after MJF defeats um, Danielson, that his next uh, opponent will be somebody like Cole. And I, I agree with that choice. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, it'll be real interesting. I still don't know how Cole got his concussion in that last match. I think we talked about this before where I went back, I watched Forbidden Door. And um, I thought, you know, when we were, when I was at, I was at Forbidden Door and I thought that Okada, Okada has the, the top, the best drop kick in the business. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought Okada, Okada hit him with two drop kicks. And I thought, oh, wow, it, it looked like you really smacked him with one of them. And maybe that's what did it. But going back and watching those drop kicks, they were pretty safe. So it's so part of it's hitting the mat. When you hit the mat and you're, you know, you do the fall and your hands go out and you try to spread out the damage. Sometimes you can't help it. Your brain gets rattled when it hits the mat. As protected as he try to be, especially since he had just come off of another concussion. So the body's a funny thing. It was just a little fragile. And, you know, he got he got caught at the wrong time with another concussion. And it was bad. You could tell it was bad when he was talking about it. And he got the tears in his eyes. And he's like, Britt didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know what was wrong. You know. So I'm I'm glad he's healthy again. I'm glad he's cleared, and I'm glad he's back. That's that's really the only positive outcome that there could be from from being concussed the way he was, and yeah. it's the best news possible. Bad news for the locker room, good news for the audience. Yeah, and um, I great to see him back, and I hope he's uh, I hope he's back on BTE. With the Bucks because they always have they're they're always entertaining together yep. and uh, I hope he does some stuff with the Dark Order again because the the stuff that John Silver and and uh, Adam Cole did with Budge it was it was some of, some of my favorite humor in in AEW I loved the Budge stuff I thought it was hilarious it was getting over there were audience signs with Budge it was just it was John Silver is, is charismatic as hell uh, Alex Reynolds isn't bad and Silver and Cole together are good. I think they may try to recruit him. They've been on the recruitment tour of mm -hmm. 2024 or 2023 or whatever. Uh, I think there they'll try go. to recruit Budge. I think they'll try to recruit him. Yeah. 
that would be great if they brought they brought uh, uh, Adam Cole in. Um, we'll see what happens. Absolutely, absolutely. The next segment was Jungle Hook versus Big Bill and Lee Moriarty of the Firm, which not rated well overall on uh, Cage side, but I liked it. I thought it was fun. Uh, it was clear Hook definitely, definitely the green man out of everybody. Um, and Jungle Boy, you know, his extensive tag background with, with Luchasaurus allowed him to be the leader of the team. And there was, there was one spot specifically, and they played it off uh, in, in the announcing, but it's a very common tactic. And Moriarty tried to get in, his, in, in Hook's face, tried to bait him in. And the ref turned, like fully expected Hook to jump in the ring and do that spot, and he didn't. And so Taz had to play it off. Hey, you know, he didn't get baited in by Moriarty. I think he just failed the spot because uh. in tag wrestling, that's a major face issue is getting getting suckered in by the by the heels so they can right. work your partner right. over in the corner. It, it always happens. And so I think that was Hook's inexperience. And I don't mm -hmm. think we'll see it twice. I think he'll pick up on that spot. Uh, he got the big uh, overhead suplex with Big Bill to a massive pop. They they teased it a couple times, and then he finally got it. I think they work together well. Hook, this is a much, much better choice than trying to pair him up with Dan Housen in a comedy act. I just, <laughs> I'm so glad they did not continue it. It was fun for a little bit, but realistically, I think this is a better pairing. I think it'll allow Hook a little bit more uh, widening of his, his repertoire so he's not always doing the same sort of stuff in ring. He needs seasoning. He's still super green no matter how good he is. Uh, Big Bill, I've, I've liked for a long time. I liked him as Big Cass. I was disappointed when he let his demons get ahead of him. Uh, his partnership with Enzo, I loved back in the day. And I'm glad to see him clean, back on track, on TV, He's a big dude. He moves around well for his size. And, you know, he's got some charisma. He showed it a few times to me. I'd like to see it more. And, of course, Moriarty is, is he's got Tiger style. It's about all I can say about Moriarty. <laughs> right. What'd you think of right. it? I like the match. I thought, um, you know, it's interesting that the, the Jungle Hook or, or whatever they were calling it, you know, they kept billing it as like one time only. Mm -hmm. But I thought they functioned pretty well as a team. Um, like you mentioned, yeah, you know, Hook Hook made some mistakes. He's about as green as they come. I mean, he's only mm -hmm. had what three tag matches in his whole career, and you know, he he just he doesn't even have an hour in the ring um, <laughs> yet professionally. So he's as green as they come. He he didn't have the benefit of going through developmental and all that. So he's going to make mistakes as he mm -hmm. as he moves along, especially as he gets into more competitive matches. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's fine how they're using him. Um, he's he's super over. It seemed like, you know, Hook seemed like the star in that match, not Jungle Boy. And it's just kind of interesting because, you know, Jungle Boy has so much more experience than Hook. Um, and they've been pushing Jungle Boy for three years. But Hook, Hook, Hook got a bigger pop from the crowd, but that's just kind of the way they've been uh, setting him up for. And, yeah, the, the last thing I have to say about the match was that T-bone suplex on Big Bill that, Mm -hmm. That Hope pulled off. That's what everyone wanted to see. Yep. Um, they, you know, they teased it the week before. They teased it at the beginning of the match, and and it did not disappoint. It was it was pretty sweet. And the, uh, yeah, the thing about Hook is, and and him and Jungle Boy, yes, he's definitely green. He doesn't have a lot of experience. He's the the male Jade Cargill technically, um, but you could also see he's improving. And, of course, Jungle Boy, he's put in all the work. He's improved significantly for the first couple of years. The the hot tag was to hook. And when he came in, he did okay. He ran a little wild. It wasn't a Nick Jackson hot tag, but he was good. Um, you know, he's got to develop. And the crowd's still responding to him, so that's good. They love Jungle Boy and his music. So, you know, I thought it was a great pairing. I really did. I, I'd like to see it more. I know they build it as one time. I'd like to see more of that team. I think there's there's more stories to be told with those two. Yeah, it kind of made me think, you know, it might be good for Hook to be in tag matches for a while to kind of hone his skills mm -hmm. uh, 
and that way all the pressure's not on him to have like you know bangers against guys who've been fighting for 10 years longer than him where they're they're you know they're carrying him so um I, yeah i'd like to see more of the tag team and i don't know what else they're going to be doing with jungle boy until christian returns if christian returns so um yeah I, i'm i'm good with more of it and as far as the firm goes you know they're they're fine as as mid card jobbers. Um, I guess I'd like to see them do more with Big Bill. They don't really book their big guys well um, as far as making them look like winners or look like threats. So I'd like to see Bill get a get a push because um, he is he is a monster mm-hmm. and he's he looks great. He's gotten himself in really good shape, better than I I can remember him looking in uh, you know back in in his WWE or NXT days. Mm-hmm. So. So I'd like to see that pay off for him, the hard work that he's been putting in pay off and uh, him get a push. I think it will. Uh, I, I think Tony likes him. I mean, he, he hired him even after all the issues that, that he had in the past. So uh, I'm just, I'm happy to see him working. Like I said, I was a fan of his for a long time. And I'm also just happy to see him working. The firm is sort of mid and that's fine. Let him be mid till they get over. That's right. Yep, I agree. Speaking of mid, the next segment was the MJF interrupting Takeshita uh, Danielson intro just so he could talk smack about Danielson. Now, MJF, as always, playing the heel, as always, did the one thing you really should not do. Made fun of Takeshita's pronunciation. He called him <laughs> take a shitta. And it's what people, it's what I did a couple of times. In my head, it's hard not to because in English, yeah. it's take a shitta. But... Right. To, to Keshta, first of all, his Japanese promo. I don't understand Japanese, but the fans responded. Doesn't matter what language you speak. If the fans are behind you, you're going right. to be a star. Then yep. he broke out some English, which we talked about earlier today. Better than somebody like Shinsuke Nakamura, who's been in the U.S. for decades now. And still has a tough time cutting a promo, which is why he's limited in WWE. I think if Takeshita can keep improving his English promo skills, he's absolutely going to be a megastar no matter where he is. He's already a star. He's a rising star, but I think he's going to be over as a megastar. I'll I'll say it again. I love Takeshita. I never knew who he was until he showed up in AEW. I was not a Japanese fan. I'm not big into the Japanese market. I'm, I'm aware of it, but I'm not a big fan of it. And he's impressed me from day one i loved what he's done i love what he's doing and yeah if he can pick up a little bit more english and like you said he learned english from kenny in ddt it was either you or it was krillin but either way yeah yeah, i love that that's uh, it shows me that he wants to be here he's moved here he wants to be in the u.s he wants to get over he wants to learn the language and with people like Omega, with all of the Japanese wrestlers that are in AEW, with all the bilinguals like Jericho and everybody else, if he works at it, he's going to be able to master English. Maybe a slight accent, that's fine. But that will get him more over. That'll really make him a star. And of course, Danielson, I mean, come on. He's... He has to beat everybody till he gets to face MJF. And MJF's a good promo, as always. But the best thing that he did was ran up the the uh, the stage, ran up the, the entrance when Danielson showed up. Ran like a goddamn chicken. Because yep, right like the coward he is. That's where his character is sold. Because he talks a great game. He talks everybody down. He ruins them verbally. And then he's a fucking chicken shit. <laughs> heel 101. It, it is, but it's more than that. It, this is like oh, Heel yeah. 304 by this point. He's <laughs> He's got the basics down, but he's selling it in such a way. He ran up that ramp so fast. I thought he was trying to to make it in the NFL doing doing uh, uh, you know whatever those quarter mile dashes or whatever they do in in training. He was just gone. <laughs> it was like that was hysterical. So yes, his promo's good and it's set up more with Danielson, but his selling of being a chicken shit heel is what really really makes his character great. He takes a receipt like nobody's business. 
Yeah, and he also played up to the L.A. crowd by ripping on the celebrities that were in attendance. Of course, you always have celebrities in attendance at, at stuff in L.A., and mm -hmm. he uh, went after pretty pretty good, calling out Ken Jong and um, uh, Freddie Prinze. Um, I'm not too familiar with either of those guys, but uh, their reactions were pretty funny, and the crowd response was great. Well, Ken Jong, I'm very familiar with. I'm a fan of his since the Hangout. He's done Crazy Rich Asians. He's on The Masked Singer. He had his own show, Dr. Ken, for a while. They brought that up. MJF did. He's 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 really funny. He's extremely funny. He's a great actor. Um, and he's a legitimate doctor and a stand-up comedian. He's, he's so multi-talented, it's not funny. And Freddie Prince, former WWE writer. Does, I did not know it. Yes, he's a big-time former writer and trying to start his own promotion, I might add. So, okay. Freddie Prince is not unknown to the wrestling world at all. Uh, plus, you know, he did the Scooby-Doo stuff, and, you know, he did all the other stuff that MJF brought up. But, sure. yeah, he's, he's definitely known in wrestling because he's a former writer and trying to start his own promotion. As a matter of fact, most people, if, you know, the, those of us who are marks and paying attention, thought Bray might sign with Freddie Prince Jr.'s new promotion instead of yeah. AEW or WWE just to be the big name of that promotion and to gain eyes. He didn't, but he could have. As a matter of fact, if things happen and Triple H quits WWE for reasons, he might go to somewhere like Freddie Prince Jr. and help him build it from nothing. But Stephanie is worth 150, Hunter's worth 100 million. I don't think they need to work. Right. But that was yeah, Freddie Prince. And um Yeah, um so so the match finally got underway and, and it was it was a banger. It was it was an excellent match. Um As always. I, one of my, my favorite parts of the match was um Daniel Bryan went for a victory roll and mm -hmm. Takeshita countered it almost into a tombstone. Mm. And then after that he picked Brian up and gave him the Everest suplex, the Everest German suplex right out of that. That whole sequence was incredible. Um, As we know, Takeshita is a master of the German suplex. And yep. he showed his versatility, that strength to be able to just lift a person dead weight. They're not jumping. He's got them held and then just bridge up and over. Anytime wrestlers do that, they get my applause because that is damn hard to do. And... I don't care who you are. If you can do that to someone, good on you. <laughs> but yeah, Takeshita is amazing. And Takeshita looked like a monster in there with Brian. Mm -hmm. Like he's a, he's a horse. He's super strong he's, and he's, super he's, agile. He can do it all. He's got he's got so much potential. He's six one. Uh, he's a beefy six one. That's and and I don't care who you are. That's actually an impressive size. I know people like Kingpin are like, ha, 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 that short. But I don't care. 6'1 in wrestling is a pretty good size. And for a Japanese man, 6'1 is impressive. Yeah. Um, it, he, he's looking more and more like uh, Yoshihiro Takayama, mm -hmm. um, the uh, MMA fighter slash All Japan slash New Japan fighter. Who was uh, who was unfortunately paralyzed? He he got injured in the ring and and has been paralyzed since 20, 2019. Um, but Takeshi was looking more and more like him. And I was actually I just looked up to see how many times those guys if they ever fought each other. It looks like they were in a they have faced off a few times in DDT back in two thousand sixteen two thousand seventeen. So I'll have to look up those matches and just see the size difference between the two. Probably not much. Probably not much. No. Nope. Obviously, Danielson won. It was it was you know submission match. He he passed Takeshita passed out, so he got that sort of victory. Of I didn't submit, but you know what can you do? It's Danielson. It's really hard to win when Danielson's entire storyline right now is he has to beat everyone, and this was his first challenge. So we knew he wasn't going to win, but it was again Takeshita against the top of the field, the top of the card, the best of the best, looking amazing in defeat and still getting all of the crowd support. This is an example 
of win loss doesn't matter when it's done right win loss doesn't matter and Takeshita is going to be huge give it a year give it two years he's gonna get the push and I cannot wait and yeah, Don Kellis was uh was been seen at at, at P, the PWG show was referenced um Takeshita was at at PW the PWG show at, at the you know the weekend before um Dynamite and uh, Don Killis was scoping out Takeshka some more there. So that's becoming more and more of a story is there's a, something's going to happen between Killis and Takeshita. Um, is Takeshka going to join the elite or is he going to reject the elite and start feuding with them? Um, we'll see what happens there. Um, also of note that uh, Meltzer said that uh, Takeshka, that his match with Brian was his third best match over the past week. So... <laughs> I have not yet reviewed the, all the matches from, from the Battle of L.A. in PWG, the big annual tournament they do. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I believe the finals was against Speedball Mike Bailey, who mm -hmm. is one of the one of the most entertaining wrestlers in the world. I've heard um, good stuff so, about him. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to seeing that. But it's just crazy. I thought this match was outstanding. Um, it kind of – I did not like the finish. It was kind of out of nowhere abrupt. It was kind of a shock finish. And I mean, they just ran out of time. They, yeah. they could only go 15 minutes. Um, but yeah, I mean, those two had the potential to to put on a five star match. And I, I thought up until the finish, it was one of the best matches that I've ever seen on on Dynamite. Um, but yeah, hopefully we'll get some some better finishes the next time to catch the fights, and maybe hopefully he'll start winning. So. Well, I don't think Danielson to catch is the last time we've seen that. I think we're going to see that match up again. And yeah, I think if they get a little bit more time or if they time it a little different, it could be a much better finish. Um, I thought it was okay for the finish. I thought the match itself was fantastic, though. Yeah, for sure. So next up, we're halfway through already. Think about this. We're almost timing it correctly this week. Uh, <laughs> I think there's more we want to talk about. Um, next up is the Baker Hater uh, Storm Soraya which obviously we've talked about it for weeks now. Mercedes was, ex was, was we wanted her to show up. All the fans really wanted her to show up, but she didn't. And that was on us, not on AEW. They never talked about it except for the one wink and nod at the camera, which tells me maybe after the, the appearance in February, She'll show up maybe at Revolution. We'll see then. But the as always, Hater in the match with Baker, Storm, Soraya is a great match. I thought they did really well. It wasn't rated well on Cage Match, but I think a lot of people were upset because Sasha didn't show up, because Mercedes didn't show up. But I liked it. Hater and, and Baker got the win. I thought that was the right choice because Hater's the champ. And, you know, just continued the feud with Storm Soraya and uh, Sheeta. Yeah, I think a lot of people are upset about the Mercedes thing. Tony Khan did tease it. Uh, I mean, I mean, the first tell was, you know, I mean, you 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 got Sasha or, or Mercedes booked in to show up at Wrestle Kingdom, and it's, it's you know it's one hundred percent going to happen. So it's not a stretch to think she'll fly in from L.A., you know, a couple days, fly in to L.A. from Tokyo a couple days later. And, you know, Tony was straight up asked, you know, is, is Sasha going to be on the show? And he just put this big smile, oh, I can't comment on that. Like, almost like it was a done deal. And everyone's like, holy shit, he's got her. And it's like Tony's never let us down in the past. You know, there was, there was teases for CM Punk. He was never announced. Um, there's been teases for other things, other, um, but... You know, it, it didn't happen, and I I almost think that it was going to happen, and they couldn't agree on money, and Sasha's just like, no. Or, or someone got in Sasha's ear and said, hey, look, you know, you're only going to gonna hurt your value by going to AEW because it'll piss off WWE, which, in, in my opinion, is bad advice because look at Cody <laughs> and how he was able to raise his stock. I mean, if Sasha can, can go to AEW and... and be the best pop on the crowd, it'll just make WWE want her even more from a competition standpoint. So so I don't really get why she didn't appear. Um, I don't get why Britt Baker teased, 
you know, last week by saying the boss and the timing of the whole mystery partner. So I, I, I guess I just don't, those are the type of games that, that WWE has played with their fans over the years. And I, I didn't, I didn't appreciate it. I mean, frankly, I, I don't really care that much. It's just, not, it's not like I was disappointed. Right. But I, I do understand the people who are, especially someone who like went to that thinking she was going to be there and spent the money. So here's the thing. Um, as far as the teases and all that, they, they started it with the two tickets and I've got friends who are going to show up, uh, check offs, uh, ringside tickets as it were. The, the fact is they, they wanted it to be Mercedes and Naomi. They did. It looks like Naomi went back to WWE. So that got written out. And then the, the whole thing with Sasha, I think when she signed with new Japan, I think they want to keep her North American debut for their show. Understandable. That's their yeah, star. Yeah. And I think she'll show up after. Their show is in February, Revolution's early March. I think that's why we'll see her in March. I think she'll be at Revolution. I think, uh, again, the working relationship between New Japan and AEW is such that even if she signed with New Japan, there's very little reason she shouldn't be able to show up in AEW, at least at Forbidden Door. But right, right, at the very least, yeah. The reason she didn't show up is I think it had to do with her New Japan contract. And they wanted her to be North American reveal first with them before she works anywhere else. Sort of like what what uh, what Tony did with Brian Danielson. Didn't want him to work yeah. in the Pacific Northwest until he could get Danielson's crowd in his building. Right. And, I can't, and that was a great decision, yeah. And I can't blame anybody for that. I still right. think Sasha signed maybe, maybe just a year with New Japan. I don't think she signed for long. I think she's going to renegotiate in a year. And boy, she definitely made the right choice getting the hell out of WWE. Because... Yeah. Because Vince didn't respect her, and now Vince is back. So that's all I got to say. She made the right choice, and I was okay with their match, even though she didn't show up. It didn't bother me. It was a fine match. They had storyline. They had sheeted with the kendo stick. Tried to give it to one. Ended up in the heels. Heel. It's fine. The audience set themselves up for disappointment. It's nobody's fault. There was a couple of teases, but Baker likes to troll. How can you hold that against her? She's a troll. Yeah, so. I, I still think AEW could have said, you know, she's not going to be there. And they did. Through a press release or something wow. like that. I mean, they, they Meltzer said Mel, Meltzer came out and said that she's not, she wasn't going to be there. And and a lot of us were like, oh well, Meltzer's wrong half the time. <laughs> and I'm like, so I mean, I I, I still thought she was going to show up despite Meltzer's report because As... I thought things are, it was a fluid situation. Like yeah. she could or could not show up. And um, that's that's yeah, still Meltzer possible. Turned out, Meltzer turned out to be right. So. Here's here's the thing. I think the reason Tony didn't deny it is ratings. Because if he denied it, then people who wanted to see her wouldn't sh tune in. Yeah. And that's still, he didn't he didn't say no, but he also didn't say yes. And that's right. again not on anybody's shoulders except the audience who anticipated it, set themselves up. And then when he she didn't show, it's it's somehow Tony's fault, you know. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see the next time something is teased like that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think he lost some goodwill with his I do. fans. And I've seen fans saying that you know he ruined my goodwill. Like I'm not going to travel for a show because he's teasing a debut because he could just screw us over like he did here and tease something that didn't happen. So I think he did lose a little oh. goodwill. I don't know if it's quite that severe. He still got a ton of goodwill in the bank. But yeah, I think he lost a little goodwill from yeah. people who literally wanted to see her and built themselves up to see her. But we'll see. We'll see how he recovers from it. I think he's doing okay. But yeah, he lost a little goodwill. Absolutely. And whether or not she decides to, to sign with AEW, I just, I don't know, just, you know, once you take that step and, and create that precedent of, of quitting on a company because you don't like creative... You know, what's to stop it from happening again? It, it's just a horrible thing to do. And so I'm not, I don't have any hope that like Sasha could get signed and carry the women's division and elevate it in AEW just because I just don't think she has is, has the character to do it. 
I, know, I, also, I hear what you're saying, and... but you yeah. also were at the same job for 25 years. <laughs> Versus myself, who changes jobs about every three to five years. And I will tell you, I've walked out of jobs, a lot of jobs. Sometimes it's to make a statement against management. I walked out on Pizza Hut for principal reason. I showed up the very next day for work. The manager said, you won't do that again. I looked him straight in the eye and said, damn straight, it won't happen again. Because I was putting it on them. They caused it. I walked out because of their choices. He, they, I mean, I'm sorry, WWE absolutely disrespected Mercedes multiple times and treated her like shit. I do not blame her at all for walking out. And Naomi went with her in solidarity. Good on her. Laurenitis and Vince McMahon, the two biggest scumbags in the frickin' company. Yeah, I agree with her. What's to say she doesn't do it again? That's hard to say. If she She's in New Japan. It's the second wrestling company she's worked for. That'll be the precedent. Will she walk out on them? I'll be honest. I walked out on my own mother. I walked out of a business that my mother was running because she drove me freaking nuts and I walked yeah. out on her. And yeah. and I will tell you, I will quit on anybody if they disrespect me and treat me poorly. Mm -hmm. And it's not me. My principles say you will not treat me like that. Yeah. So I, I, I have a difference of opinion based off of my work habits. You have a, you believe one thing because you were at a company for 20, you still are for 25 years. So yeah, I wouldn't say it has anything to do with that. It's more so if you look at the president of people who've done that in the past, and I think of two other examples, CM Punk did it mm -hmm. and you can see how his, his tenure in AEW ended and ultimate warrior was another guy who you know, right before SummerSlam, he went in and said, I'm not fighting unless you give me more money. True. And, you know, he, and then he ended up walking off anyways, I think after he was given the, the raise. Mm -hmm. So it's people that, that walk out in the wrestling industry, no other industry. I mean, every, every situation is different, but in the, re in the wrestling industry, if you don't honor your, your, your contract and show up after you've been advertised uh, because you want more money or something like that, it's, or because you don't like where creative's going, you know, if you don't have a creative clause in your contract, well, it, it just, it's just a bad look because there's nothing stopping you from doing it again. Um, so that's that, that's kind of how I see it. It's just it's just a line that, um, that know, you, you, you personally wouldn't cross. cross. You personally no, don't no, like it. It has nothing to do with me. I'm okay. just talking about from from the, in, if you look at wrestling history and the people who have done this, they all have never gone on after doing something like that stone cold to have to have the type of success that they did previously stone cold walked out on wwe multiple yeah, times yeah and he had no he only did it once that i'm aware of and he came back and had three more matches and then retired his he, I, I don't think he's a, he said he regrets it of course and, he said that you know, and but again he only had three more matches after he came back you know a, a year later like his career was basically over when he did that he just didn't want to be on that list of names, a job to Lesnar, and can't blame him. Well, um, he again, his entire point, it was all creative. Why do it on a random Monday night without announcement or build when we could make a pay-per-view out of this? Mm -hmm. the, it was so, it was a creative disagreement. Yeah, and there's examples of other creative disagreements that where they didn't turn into a big deal. I think it was was I think it was Arn Anderson was or, or it might have been no, no, it was Greg Valentine. Um, mm -hmm. it, was, it was a good example of that. He, you know, he's like, I'm not going to lose on TV. Um, this was after his WWF run, mm -hmm. and um, you know, he he sat out that match, um, but you know, they were able to work things out. It's not like he bailed on a, um, you know, on a, on an advertised match or or bailed on the company before a pay per view. So, um, yeah, that's just that's just. It's just a line that once that line is crossed in the wrestling industry, um, it, you know, it, it, it just, for, for me, I, I just think it's a trust thing with that particular performer is, is I, how reliable are they going to be? I, I hear you and that's your perspective and I'm not changing it. All right. I just disagree. <laughs> All right. Uh, and the, the next segment, probably the worst of the entire night. And it was Jericho of all people. 
and it's not that it was bad. It started off pretty well, you know, fairly typical Jericho stuff. It just dragged and dragged and dragged. I mean, they gave him a full 15 minutes. They really should not have. They should have cut that down to seven, give the rest to the elites and, and Death Triangle. But, you know, they came out, they did their promo. Action Andretti came out. Starks came out. They had a little tete-a-tete. They had already announced Jack Hager versus Ricky Starks. And so then they made the match. I'm not sure how that worked. That was very odd, but that's what they did. And it was just, it was a very confused segment to me. It was, there was too much time. Um, I, it, it, there was no reason for it to go more than five minutes. And I think it did. I think it went seven or eight minutes, which was just crazy for, for with that. I mean, there should have been a brawl or something. Um, get yeah. top flight involved, even it up, run around the building. Um, but yeah. And I don't know if it was, I guess I'd have to go back and, and I don't because generally Ricky Starks does a great job, but I, but it, you know Andretti seemed flat. Um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I don't think it's a big deal. I, it was just a bad segment. Sometimes they don't work, and oh. you just, just move on. What capped it off was Jake Hager. I'm gonna knock your face off your face or whatever he said. It was the stupidest comment, <laughs> and that that epitomized the entire segment. Do not let Jake Hager get a, a microphone. Just don't. Let him stand there, look dumb in his hat. Yeah, I just the can, he whole, still say, can he still say I like this hat though? He doesn't have to say it into a microphone. He's loud. He he can say it and people will hear him. <laughs> I like his quips. I like his one liners. He's I don't he's, like when he tries to do more than that, but he's he's still developing. He's he's a he's a, a veteran and former world champion, but he's still developing because He's really not that good, and he's had a mouthpiece for a long time. He's great right. as the enforcer. Yeah. Leave yeah, him. Let me do that. The head thing's funny. My brother got me a, a purple bucket hat yeah. for uh, Christmas, and, and he had it inscribed because you, you can buy the hat and get them inscribed with where it says hat on the, nice. on the front of the bucket hat, just like that guy signed at the, at the one show. Right. No, I, I, I thought he would have got it. I like this hat. <laughs> That's what he should have well, said. AEW released, AEW is now selling the purple bucket hat that says, I like this hat on it. So, Perfect. They're AEW so stole smart. my brother's idea. He, he should get royalties on it. He that. should. Well, uh, technically, it's Hager's. True, idea. true. I mean, <laughs> technically. Uh, personally, I, I think that's getting over more than anything. I saw him on Darker Elevation, and I was like, wow, Hager's actually wrestling. And he yeah. did good. I, I liked his match. And it yeah. was about the hat. Oh, that's what it was. The guy he fought did the stalling German suplex to Hager. I was like, damn, dude. Wow. He picked he picked him up over his head. It was impressive. So some of those dark and elevation matches, those shows are starting to get good. I'm really starting to enjoy some of the YouTube stuff. I'll, I'll admit that. Yeah, it's been, I haven't seen the last week or so, but I, I it's definitely been picking up. This week, Dark and Elevation were both really good. Um, I mean, they're slow spots, but they had storyline through uh, with with Athena and uh, Marina Shafir. They set up yeah. a match that they then did on the next show. Uh, they're continuing the storyline with Vicky Guerrero, who, thank God, is not loudly at ringside anymore um you know i don't mind her as a person or as a character i just don't want her to scream excuse me all the time i just uh but you know so those those shows are definitely getting better and seeing hager on there i was like wow he's wrestling and then they announced a match i'm like now i know he needed to get some reps in so I, I haven't seen the, the spoilers for Dark and Elevation who fought in L.A., but Yuka Sakazaki, the Magic Girl, and Mei Saruga from Choco Pro are both over um, in the U.S. right now. I don't know who they're fighting for, but maybe they'll show up on uh, Dark or Elevation next week. So Yuka Sakazaki they're... loved the Dark Order. Last year, bef not last year, before Brody died, her interactions with the full Dark Order were hysterical. So... I think yeah. whenever she shows up in the States, she must have a standing invite from AEW. Come on down. We'll get you in a match. I think they're definitely going to have her wrestle on Dark She's on the roster. She's, yeah. she's buying AEW, so, yeah. I like her. She's 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 fun. 
you know, she's a fun character. Yeah. And then the last match of the night, certainly one of the best matches on Dynamite and in general. I mean, best of seven series, they started strong, they ended strong. It was crazy from start to finish with as many ladder spots as you could possibly imagine. Uh, the Elite versus Death Triangle and holy cow. Not only did uh, did the hype man, Alejandro, Alejandro, Alex? Ronnie's. Yeah, him. Uh, get involved, <laughs> but so did Brandon Cutler. So that evened out. I love that. Uh, Cutler, to me, is the best stooge. His character, I'm he he got over with me. His character is the best when he's when he wrestles on Dark and Elevation. He's got the goofiest run you have ever seen. <laughs> he is, as far as comedy characters go, he is great. And that beard there, is out of control. Yeah, there's a reason Brandon Cutler gets chance a lot mm -hmm. of the time. You know, like during during there's a little downtime during the match. You'll hear that Brandon Cutler match chance start and then uh sometimes he'll get it on film and play it on bte and then the bucks will yell at him you're supposed to cut that out <laughs> two contract yeah. cutler is doing so much for aew it is not funny uh his his segments in bte where he did the year-end review with everybody and peter avalon thought he was going to get fired and and uh, uh ryan nemeth thought he was going to get fired it was just it was really entertaining and I'm, I'm starting to really dig BTE. They're building on it more. It's one of the reasons why All Out was sold, or All In was sold out originally. So yep. if they keep promoting and they keep using that, build storylines, get characters, figure stuff out. As a matter of fact, Dark and Elevation, they've started to have more promos. They had Juice Robinson do a promo. They had Claudio do a nice promo on Dark and Elevation. So... I, I really think they're putting, uh, I, I believe it's Matt Hardy who's helping book that along with Sean Alexander, I think. Either way, it's they're actively booking and trying to work out storylines and building the characters and developing the way they were supposed to. So, I'm, like I said, I'm loving those, those uh, segments now. Yeah, that's good, and I hope they keep doing that with the input of the the performers themselves, mm -hmm. not just not just the coaches. Um, so, and, and I'm sure that's that's how it is because that was the whole spirit behind AEW Foreman to begin with was to not have a team of writers, um, but to let the artists, mm -hmm. you know, what their art's going to be. So exactly, exactly. And speaking of art, that best of seven. Holy cow! Was there a move that didn't hurt? I mean. Ball peen, ham ball peen hammer to the hand and <laughs> ladder stomp on the other hand. Kenny Omega came out with two broken hands. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they, they played that off pretty well. Also, uh, Kenny came out um, with his Japan, or uh, New Japan, the GP US title, yep. which was great to see that, that Tony's going to let him wear that in uh, in All Japan. I'm not All Japan. In the <laughs> English <laughs> Um, that's good. That's yeah, a that's a mistake right there. That's a good one. <laughs> my, uh, yeah, I'm I'm thinking of. Uh, uh, I don't know. I think Kenny did hold the. Kenny has held the title from All Japan. He had the All Japan Junior title and had some incredible matches. Of course, it's probably the least known stint of his career. I think he was only a couple months long, but he had some bangers in All Japan. Anyhow, so go look those up. But yeah, glad that. Uh, Glad that Tony is promoting the, the IWGP US title. Yep. You know, we see it in the past with Archer and Moxley fighting for it. Archer did beat Moxley um, for that US title. It's one yep. of, we, we talked about Moxley's losses. He's only had a handful of them. Um, I think there was some shenanigans in that in that match. But uh, yeah, um, you know, Elite with another great entrance, um, Kenny with the title, and match was solid. Just it's just there's these guys do so many crazy moves it's hard to even call the match because they're like it's almost like they're making up moves on the fly <laughs> they don't have names right it was, it was a great match i think you know bucks had some some good interviews that i read uh earlier today talking about how you know the the lucia bros are is are their favorite opponent oh yeah uh, and they love 
they just love working with them because they're they both want to try so many different things you can um, tell that these teams love working together and trust each other just because the moves they do just because the crazy stuff the 450 splash from the top of the turnbuckle corner to a table yes through penta poor penta Yep. I mean, they took some hits. It was just, it was a great match. The yep. uh, the the thing that will always get me with the Bucks is how they work the ropes. Uh, it's something that that I've noticed, and I'm going to talk about it more. Maybe I'm going to get some clips and put them on the website. People in AEW are starting to use and move around and through the ropes differently than I've seen. Now it may be in in you know Mexico and Japan and some of the other indies, uh, but one example is is JD uh, from the Workhorsemen, where he throws somebody up against the ropes and then they come out they come and this is from ringside. He throws them up, they hit the ropes, they fall back down, and he clotheslines them. And they mm -hmm. copied that in WWE a week or two ago, maybe a month ago, yeah. and and that was JD, you know that he invented that. Nick Jackson, the way he gets in and out of the ring through the ropes, he just, he's effortless. He glides. Uh, Matt Jackson, almost the same. There's so many different people. There was a, a guy, Leon Ruff, uh, uh, scrawny, not scrawny. I mean, he's got muscles, but he was just small compared to his opponent. Uh, I mean, just a little tiny independent star. Uh, he did this almost a comebacker lariat, sort of like what Jungle Boy does but he kind of goes almost all the way through out the ropes and then comes back. Just amazing rope work that people are doing anymore. And yeah. it's the development of the style and we're seeing it in AEW. I will guarantee once those types of moves start to get over more, we're going to see more of it in WWE the same way they stole it from JD Drake. They're going to steal it from some of these guys. Uh, yeah. Because the, the rope work is amazing. And it all goes back to Nick Jackson kind of developing very fluid way in and out of the ring. Oh, the, the week before, Strickland versus, uh, no, yeah, it was Strickland versus AJ Fox. AR Fox. AR Fox. So Strickland yeah. does a dive over the top rope, handstand, lands on his feet outside the ring. He, he's, yeah. he's known to do that. AR Fox does a backflip and then they end up facing each other. Yeah. And then they do it on the other side of the ring with the eye. And I'm like, oh my God. That type of stuff in and around the ropes is so impressive. And it's the new next level of wrestling that we're going to see. I, I'm here for it. I am so here for it. And of course, the elite and, and death triangle do stuff in the ropes, through the ropes, around the ropes, with the ropes, to the ropes. You know, they're yeah. they're innovators. Yeah. And it was yeah, a great Kenny match. Had a, uh, oh, go ahead. I was just saying, it was a great match. Yeah, it was. Um, Kenny did a, a Rise of the Terminator, and um, I forget who if it was Pac or Penn on the table. He just moved. Kenny just went right through the table by himself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the old uh, Sabu table spots mm -hmm. where Sabu, I think... I think one of the reasons Sabu got canned from WCW is they wouldn't let him put his opponent through the table. So after his match, he would set up a table outside the ring and just flip over the ropes through the table. <laughs> just randomly. Um, and so it, it, Kenny kind of reminded me of that when he, he, he missed the rise of the Terminator and went through the table without um, without uh, landing on anyone. They did the um, Penta's Fear Factor pile driver mm -hmm. on the ladder. It's crazy. That one and hurt. I, that I one hurt. hurt. Out, like, um, how do they how do they make sure that when Kenta drops or when Penta drops, right? Uh, that that Nick's head doesn't hit the the rung of the ladder, and it's like you wonder if they like measure that out so he knows his foot has to be in a certain spot so that when he drops the pile driver, there's no that the head will just go in between the steps instead of breaking a neck. You know, I I, I, I don't know. Little, yeah. But you have to really trust your opponent to be able to take that. Yeah. And then the one winged angel off the ladder. That was yes. like a top rope move. Yep. Oh, so, you know, again, they let Kenny get the belt, not the yep. box. Right. So Kenny's another two belt. He's back to belt collector. So yes. 
that's the best version of Kenny, really, is when he has belts from other companies because he is that good. Now, one of the things that I read uh, in one of the discords was that he seems like a bigger star in Japan. And I can't yeah. deny that. I don't know what it is about his presentation that's so much better in Japan or why he comes across so much better. But I've seen... I can give you a million reasons why. <laughs> okay, because give me I, some. On a scale of 1 to 10, I think Kenny's been booked at like a 3 or a 4 in, in the States compared to... Um, you know, well, part of it is 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 Kenny's really the first gaijin to learn fluent Japanese and that can go and entertain a, a Japanese crowd speaking Japanese. Like, that hadn't really been done before. And I think the fans over there really appreciate the fact that he is completely fluent in Japanese. I think that's one of the reasons that he's so over is because he did that. You know, you got a guy like Osprey who is just as athletic as Kenny and has just as great matches um, as Kenny most of um, most of the time he hasn't had a series with okada like kenny had with okada um but yeah you know it's just the way kenny can relate to the fans over there and just i think people have a lot of respect for the journey that he took over there the unlikely journey from fighting in a comedy promotion like ddt mm. and you know just what he did with the bushi and the, the golden lover story with the bushi and then being able to come over to new japan and deliver and you know, it, it's like the whole the whole reason he got his huge push was because AJ left yep. New Japan to go to WWE, and so they needed a top guy. And they're like, "Hey, you know, this Kenny guy is killing it. Why don't we Why don't we give him the spot?" And and Kenny is bigger in um, Japan, way bigger than AJ ever was. Yeah. So um, I think part of it is he's been over there. He spent so much time over there working on his character, um, and the fact that New Japan respects him and and they don't. They don't need to. I mean, I guess in, in AEW, the, you got a weekly show. You got to be on TV, you know, 40, 50 times a year. Yeah. Whereas in New Japan, um, you know, it's really just the big shows. They're, they're quarterly, they're quarterly pay per views, they're quarterly big shows right. that, um, and, and the crowd will come out to see that. And that's what everyone really pays attention to is the big matches. So I think that overexposure. You know, is there? And then part of it was Kenny wanted a lot of guys. He they the elite wanted to put people over to help establish AEW. They First didn't year, all else. yeah. I mean, Kenny was a champion, but he was a tag champion with Hangman. That first year, world title, nope. Tag titles, I mean, yeah, the Young Bucks, the ones that everybody thought, oh, they're going to be tag champions immediately, they weren't. Right. So, yeah, they and and once they lost the tag titles, Kenny and and Hangman went back and forth with each other. But I, I agree, they have spent a lot of time to build up the rest of the company, and they've right. gotten their rewards. They've got the tag titles, they got the trios titles, they are EVPs. They do get presented special. I mean, uh, I'd I'd like to see more. Uh, obviously, I'm a fan. I want them to do bigger and better all the time. Uh, you know, I, I think Kenny will get over as long as he's on TV and not hurt. But he pushes himself to such a point that it's inevitable he's going to be hurt. So, well, I think one of the things that I noticed during the Best of Seven series is he was working backdrop suplexes with Pac uh, mm -hmm. in the first couple of matches. And a backdrop suplex is basically when you get dumped straight on your head. And when you when you land and again i'm not a wrestler i'm just a mark watching these guys when you land on one of those backdrop or neck drop or head drop suplexes a lot of that impact ends up coming down on your shoulder yeah. and so you know i think it was match four kenny had worked the backdrop suplex two matches in a row and and i just i'm like dude i'm like stop and sure enough he comes out his shoulders all taped off and it's like oh my god i'm like what is he going to do? He's going to he's going to work some more backdrop suplexes and blow out his shoulder before the Osprey match. You know, is he going to have to go fight Osprey all taped up in the Tokyo Dome? And um, so it looks like he hasn't done that. Like even in his in his forty minute match against Osprey, he wasn't really working those those head drops. You don't need to do that. It, yeah, those are the most dangerous moves in the business, and there's no reason for these guys to be tearing up their shoulders. And, and putting all that stress on their spinal cord. So I it's just I just don't want to see it anymore. Um, 
That's because you like, like Kenny and you don't want him hurt. Who can blame I don't you? Want hurt. I don't want anyone dying in the ring. Yeah. And I, I mean, it's just, it's just too dangerous of a move for people to, to lose time. Like even Eddie Kingston was talking about the, the suicide backdrop of suplexes. And he's like, he's like, yeah, he's like, I love those moves when in the, when they did them in all Japan in the nineties and Dr. Death, Steve Williams and, and Misawa and Kobashi were dumping everyone on their heads. And he's like, he's like, but I won't do it. He's like, I worked a, a, a suicide backdrop once and it was the worst thing I ever felt in my neck. And yeah. he said, I won't put anyone, I'm not going to ask anyone to do that for me. I'm not going to give anyone that move. Um, and it's like, you know, it's just, let's just, let's just move past that. Um, so, so we're not, we're, so, so you can fight, uh, uh, you know, at every pay-per-view and not miss half a year for shoulder surgery and things yeah. like that. I, you know, I agree. I th- because it's important to me. And I, I'm just glad to see that, that he's moved away from that in his last couple matches and hopefully he continues to do so. I, I would, I, uh, one of the things is the, the complaints about WWE is that styles are watered down. And it's because those wrestlers up until coronavirus were on the road 300 days a year. We're doing these moves 300 days a year. Now, AEW fortunately is not at that schedule. They're going to work on live stuff this year, but it's still never going to be 300 days a year because that's not a source of income. It's a source of entertainment because as always TV rights are where you get your money now. Yep. Uh, I just, we haven't said it, but of course, the elite won. Yeah, and they got to be champions again because they were always supposed to be the first trios champions until the suspension, till brawl out. But that aside, they're now back where they're supposed to be. They get to put on some great trios matches against other people, and maybe we see some fallout with with Death Triangle. Maybe we see Penta uh, and Phoenix turn. Maybe maybe Phoenix fights Pac. I think that'd be some great matches. Um, don't know. King, Kingston might come back. He had the thing going on with uh, with Penta and and Phoenix for a long time. There's a lot of interplay. Honestly, I'd love to see Eddie and uh, Ortiz fighting the House of Black, getting outnumbered. Santana comes down and he turns on him and joins the House of Black. Something like that. Yeah. So yeah. I, I'd like to see that sort of intrigue. I really want to see House of Black develop and do more because they're they're freaking awesome that knee stomp that knee drop finisher that uh, it's like a coup de gras with his knees from the top rope that buddy murphy does oh my god that looked like it hurt a lot i i would not want to take that of course i don't want to take any moves i'm not a wrestler right right um Overall, I, I would give it a, because of some of the technical glitches, some of the microphone issues, the, the Jericho segment going way too long, I would probably rate this uh, low A, uh, maybe even a like B plus, A minus, somewhere in there. I thought it was a really, really good show. Yeah, I would say, I'll say A minus. Um, I mean, it, I think like, had uh, had the Takeshi Bryan match had a better finish, I think I would have gone A. Um, and sure. if Mercedes had showed up, uh, oh, yeah. along with that, I would have said A plus. I would have said it was probably the best episode of TV ever that AW's had. Um, had those two things both happened, um, you know, that combined with the Mox Hangman and then mm-hmm. and then the elite. like you got four of the the charter members of the company with Kenny the Bucks and Hangman Page headlining against. You know some of the the talent they brought in, um, like Danielson and, and Moxley. Right. So, um, yeah, it it was it was a great show. Um, really, the the complaints are no big deal. Um, it's going to be real interesting to see where the elite goes after this and who their next challengers are going to be. I was kind of hoping I was I picked Lucha Brothers or uh, Death Triangle to win the match because I was kind of hoping they did because I don't want Kenny and the Bucks to be burdened by the six-man titles that are the trios titles. I just don't feel like they're as much as a draw. Like, people aren't going to tune in necessarily to watch a, a, a six-man match, whereas if it was Kenny versus Brian Danielson, you better believe people are going to be tuning in for that. So I feel like, you know, 
I don't know. I, I don't want the elite burdened with six man titles that don't necessarily make them stronger. Um, whereas if they were in a great tag program, like the Bucks going heel and fighting the acclaimed, um, you know, Kenny has a, a whole bunch of opponents he can he can fight. Um, I just feel like there's more that the elite should be um, higher up in the card. So I hope they're not stuck being only seen on AEW TV in six man action. I hear you, and and because of the trios titles, they've sort of raided the tag title division, the tag division, and and there's a bunch of trio title holders or a bunch of trio teams out there which is good i think house of black i'd love to see them get the trios title cheat beat the hell out of the elite take the titles absolutely that's totally a way i'd love to see it go so that'd be a great program yeah uh, house of black versus the elite and but give I the house something to do give them the titles and let them be champions let them be dominant absolutely and then the bucks and elite you know, the bucks and omega can do other stuff they don't have to be the stars they are stars they don't have to be the stars you know i think that it's a a good um a good segue for us to talk non aew news because there is some news in the wrestling world this week hell this month yeah you might have heard something about some other company Right. Strangely enough, the largest wrestling company in the world had just a touch of turmoil this month. I first of all, I, I I fully believe it, but I'm in disbelief that Vince came back the way he did because he's like, "Hey, I think you should let me back in." No, the board voted unanimously that it would be bad for you to come back. Well, if you try to sell or if you do any sort of rights negotiation, I'm just going to say no to everything. Well, I guess you're back. I mean, he literally bullied his way back onto the board of directors as the executive director. So he's above everybody now. Yep. The majority and, shareholder, he's the boss. Yeah. Well, he always kept it that way he was always going to have the final word in everything because he's a control freak as everybody who's ever worked for him has reported he eats first he hates sneezes you do what he says period or you're out and that's uh, that's just really horrible to hear in any company that has run like a dictatorship and yep. you well, know he built I mean, back in the day, you had you had all these little promotions, all these territories running around. You know, maybe a couple guys hit millionaire status here and there, maybe. And then probably most of that wasn't even due to wrestling, right? And then you have Vince McMahon, who combined all the territories, hostile takeovers everywhere, signing the best talent, talent and right. he, he, didn't, he didn't become a millionaire. He didn't make ten million. He didn't make a hundred million. Dude's worth billions, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions. It's amazing what he he accomplished. Um, it's hard to say, like if there was no Vince McMahon, if there would be any company remotely close to the size of what he's accomplished. But yeah, he wants what's his. He wants to control the company's destiny, and he wants to cash out. Sounds like. Well, uh, I mean, realistically, the rumors are if the Saudi government, their their private investment firm, buys WWE, not only will they not care about any of his allegations, it will stop any SEC investigations because it no longer it's a privately held company, and he can basically take back over creative, which we all know that's what he wants, and. Ultimately, that's where he wants himself to be. He wants to be in charge of everything. He wants to be creative. He wants to hire and fire. He wants to be the man that everything must go through. Even if he sells the entire damned company, he wants to be the man everything goes through. And it's going to happen. I predicted it, and, and it looks like it's going to go that way. 
that the Saudis are going to buy it. They don't care about licensing in the U.S. because they can go to straight streaming. Everybody will be happy. It's just... Yeah, if, they lose, if they lose their cable presence, um, I think that'll be... I think that's bad. I think that's really bad. I it's, know everything's changing, but without cable, you're not going to be able to pick up the casual viewer who's just flipping up, th flipping through the channels anymore. You're not going to be able to say, "Joe, call your friend Joe. Hey, turn on, turn on WWE. There's this crazy stuff going. You can't do that anymore. You have to say, Joe, sign up for this streaming service, and and the guys are going to be like, well, I feel like without TV wrestling, um, it's, it's, it's going to be." it would be a free fall from there. Not necessarily quick, but over a couple of years, I think it would severely damage the amount of um, income and everything for the company if they moved off TV. I, I, I mean, we see it differently as a consumer because it would be really, it would suck that it's not on TV, etc. But everything is moving to streaming. If it's already on Peacock and Peacock keeps it, or they start a different streaming, or they stream somewhere else, or they say, fuck it, and they go international. And maybe they do. Maybe they go international and forget the U.S., because there's a whole lot of people in India. And that could be enough just from that. Who knows? It's a different world out there. And, and they were innovative in starting their own streaming service to begin with. They were an early adopter of the streaming platform against Vince's wishes. And ultimately the people who pushed for it got fired and then got re got back, got brought back for the sale. I don't even know what to predict anymore. It's Vince will do what Vince wants so that Vince can make more money. And that to me, control. <laughs> yeah, ultimately be in charge of the company until he dies at his desk. Because for 40 plus years, 50 plus years, the only thing that's mattered to him is this company. Morning, noon, night, he barely got any sleep. He was the most driven person in that entire company. And yes, he drove them to success. I can't say otherwise. But by that same token, once they got rid of him, what did he do with his day? Thought about how to get back. Clearly, that's all he cared about. I got bad advice. I'm coming back. I'm taking the WWE back. Uh, that's all he wanted. And the Saudis are going to give it to him. So why wouldn't he go? I don't think Comcast. I don't think Peacock. I don't think Disney. I don't think any of those other companies are going to give him the same leeway and control the way the Saudis will. At the same time, the Prince is going to start booking WrestleMania, and you're going to see Goldberg versus Lesnar for the title again. Yeah, I was saying, I can't wait for the Goldberg versus Undertaker best of seven series. And yeah. Out, you know, the Elite versus Death Triangle. Yeah. I, it's the worst case scenario that the Saudis buy it, but it's also the most likely to me. When I heard Stephanie quit, very first thing I thought was Saudis bought WWE. Immediate re reaction, knee-jerk reaction was Saudis bought it and she's out. Because yeah. one, you can't have a woman CEO. And two, ugh, you just can't, can't approve of being owned by the Saudis. You just can't. Yeah. Um, it was, it was so interesting when, uh, you know, you basically had all the dirt sheet writers, all the news guys the other night. What, what night was that? Was it Tuesday night or Monday night? Um, before everything went down. I think it was Monday night when uh, everyone said, oh, the news that WWE is for sale and that they, they potentially could be sold to the Saudis. Like, it was just amazing, the, the whole response on Twitter. Um, and I, you know, I was like, it, it you know, it hasn't been confirmed. And it's the, the loopholes they're going to have to run through. And I think, mm -hmm. and I'm assuming that, again, I don't know about the rules behind all these, you know, these takeovers in the stock market. Um, I've worked for a, a privately held company, so I don't have to worry about this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the U.S. government probably isn't thrilled about, um, you know, one of their most watched television um, 
shows going being owned by Saudi Arabia. They're, they're, so I, I feel like there's going to be some some things they would have to get through before they allow it to happen. Um, however, however, it's would be the most profitable move for the shareholders. Yep. Um, if the Saudi, these Saudi princes really don't don't give a crap about about dropping eight billion of their two hundred million billion dollar disposable six, slush fund, six hundred billion dollars in their investment fund, six hundred right. billion. So I mean, they, they could oh. outbid any company easily in the, in the U.S. Um, yeah. So. So yeah, I think it's a possibility. However, I think there's going to be some encouragement from the u.s government to prevent that from happening somehow so so we, we will see what happens i don't think it's a done deal i think that legally they might run into issues oh yeah but it's certainly going to be an interesting time and i, I feel sorry for the talent over there on one hand and on the other hand i don't here's because here's, here's... you know you go you go you work for for wwe they're the biggest company mm -hmm. However, you went and worked for the biggest sleaze bag in, in, in the business. And a lot of these guys re-signed after, um, after all these allegations came out against Vince. So you kind of deserve it because you went and you, you went and to work for a sleaze bag. So if you don't like that they're going to Saudi Arabia and you're going to have to quit and not get paid because you're, you're, you're stuck with a non-compete and you're not getting a, a paycheck, that's your own fault because you went to work for a scumbag. Either sack up and go work for Saudi Arabia or... You know, sit at home and and think about why you made that decision and 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 suffer because of it. Pre AEW, there really wasn't a lot of choice. They right. were they were stuck with the monopoly. Now that AEW is a thing, I feel bad for the people who resigned during the Triple H regime, the six months the Triple H really had control. I feel bad for them because they came under false pretenses. Even last week, they had that meeting right before SmackDown. Nothing's going to change. Everybody remains where they are. Everything remains the same. We're going to be fine. And then the very next week, Quiffany, Quiffany, <laughs> Stephanie quits. Right. Which tells me there's a lot more turmoil internally than anything else. Uh, years ago, years and years ago, I said this. The worst decision WWE ever made was going public. Because then they were beholden to Wall Street. When they were privately owned, they could do anything the network let them get away with. That was the that was the heady days of the Attitude Era. It was after they went public, because basically it's a giant loan. That's all that ever is. It's a big influx of money from people, but you have to pay them back slowly. That's really all that ever is. And because they were trained to Wall Street and they were chained to stockholders and stock prices, they couldn't do what they really wanted to do. And so that to me was always their big downfall was when they went public. So going private now solves all sorts of issues. They've been public for years and years and years. People have made money off them. Stephanie's a 150 millionaire. Paul Levesque is 100 million. That's just based off of stock alone, really. So right. they, they, they get a huge payday. They don't ever have to work again. But at the same time, by taking it private, they remove all that outside pressure. Now, the only people they're beholden to are the sole owners, which are the Saudi government, basically. And they're going to let Vince kind of do what he wants. It's assuming they sell. Um, to Saudi Arabia. So I, I'm, that's still that's still again for me the most likely scenario. Now that said, Vince has already said it may not go through. We might not end up selling, and he's still right. going to get creative control back. Right. So, mm. so I I just thought I would discuss. You said that you think it was a mistake for WWE to go public. So, yeah. um, if you look at their revenue. They didn't really start making billions of dollars a year until like five years ago, well into their tenure of of going going public. So if I look at their, if I look at their, they they went public in what like two thousand nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, so right they, after they bought WCW, they blew up in twenty eighteen. Um, Those were that was the Fox deal, that was the yeah. Saudi deal, 
and then that was re-signing with us uh and peacock they got billions yep. for those yep. licensing rights so that's post pg era and and frankly like it, it doesn't make any sense because if, if you if you take the stock price and you map that against number of viewers watching their weekly shows like it, it it's you have two lines going in opposite directions yep. but for some reason the cable companies and these cable deals are worth so much more now than they were pre-2018 it's crazy and i don't i don't know that i understand it i don't know why there's all of a sudden so much money in tv you see it in baseball too you know in the sports um the advertising on television is the amount of money you can make doing that is insane well i think robert might or not robert who is it is it lawyer scott who works in tv ad um i'm not sure i think it's lawyer scott does does that type of stuff and he could really tell us uh exactly what's going on as far as advertising dollars but i think from an outsider's perspective what i've seen is advertisers paying more and the cable companies trying to keep shows because there's a ton of people moving to netflix and prime and all these other streaming services so there's a real battle of of cable cutters versus terrestrial tv and terrestrial tv struggling it really is it's it's there's 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 a shift and it's been coming for a while and i think corona really solidified for a lot of companies that people are watching in different ways now people are watching through their phones more people are watching through their computers more streaming services are significantly more powerful bigger bigger and better deals you got amazon with nearly unlimited money you have netflix which is still throwing billions of dollars at people struggling yep. to keep their their base there's a war and i think signing a five-year deal when they did in 2018 was because fox and usa saw it coming and once the saudis paid 10 million for four shows which by the way that was the deal they paid 10 billion dollars or some stupid amount for like four shows a year yeah they're totally gonna buy the company for six billion that absolutely the only thing holding them back is some legalities otherwise it's a done deal it really is there's no so the, so the saudis aren't what i what i'm just pulled up is they they gave um for a 10-year deal saudi arabia gave wwe uh 500 million for a 10-year deal so okay I, I didn't know what the numbers were, but they were still crazy. Yeah, I knew it wasn't billions because I I, I keep up with the, the financial, the year-end financial stuff mm -hmm. just because it's just so amazing to me that you got USA giving WWE a billion dollars, Peacock giving them a billion dollars, mm -hmm. and Fox giving them a billion dollars. And, uh, yeah, these, these the, the TV deals are expiring over the next, you know, one year to one and a half years. Yep. you know 12 to 15 months or whatever and it's gonna be real interesting to see what the value of the product is given viewers have gone down still good still the top rated shows on tv or among the top rated shows on tv so it's gonna be real interesting to see what happens over the next two months or uh, well two years i guess it's gonna be because everything's gonna be different in two years so, yeah that's exactly it in a couple of years the entire landscape of wrestling will be different no matter yep. what happens yep it's it's just crazy um i think we've been at this an hour and a half yep. all over i think it's probably a good time to end this i don't know that anybody except kingpin is still listening uh <laughs> he's a loyal mark um and krillin's cat krillin's cat fell asleep from what i hear <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah it was totally into our show and then just fell asleep at like the one hour mark so maybe that's what happened maybe there you go we should use the cat as a timer <laughs> <laughs> all right I, I think that'll be it uh guys again check out elitemarkorder.com 
check out our Discord if you don't know how to get to the Discord. We'll leave a link in the YouTube description to our Discord. Come on and join us. That you can do, and I'd just also like to note that our next show is going to be the life and times of Jeff Jarrett and his successes in AEW, and Scott's going to be heading up that. He's going to be putting together a video tribute for Jarrett. <laughs> video tribute. Just... Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as long as Jeff continues his current role, I don't hate it. Backstage, he's obviously great. I don't want him to have the tag titles. I don't want him on TV. Backstage, he could do whatever he's doing. Yeah. Uh, he, he's, he's actually done better at getting Satnam Singh over than Sanjay Dutt and Lethal did alone. So I'll give him that credit. I mean, that match, those two matches, that two match series with the acclaimed man, the crowd was freaking hot for those two matches. I don't so think I, that's Jarrett's fault. <laughs> it, it is though. It is though. It is. Okay. You, yeah, it's part of it. I'm saying it, it takes four to tango, and it, you know if. I thought, you know, if you would have told me, I would have been like, yeah, those matches are going to be flat. The crowd's really not going to be into it. But, man, when he comes out there for those guitar spots and he hits his finisher, what's it called? When he does the... The stroke. Like, stroke. I got right. all the stroke around <laughs> here. God, I when hate When he comes out there, man, the crowd, the crowd went crazy. And as much as I hated Jarrett going into... Um, you know, going into this, because, like, when he was WCW champ, that, that was it for me. Like, I just... I just couldn't. Um, but, like, as a mid-card heel that's on occasionally, I'm okay with it. His and entire gimmick is just Ric Flair. Just don't give him a title and don't yeah. let him talk every week. And yeah. I'm, I think I'm okay with it. Just don't. Like, if, if there was, like, if he's headlining a pay-per-view or something, like, I'm yeah, no. It's just. Right. <laughs> just, no. Yeah. No. That's all I'm saying is right, no. Right, right. And that, that, I guess that's far-fetched, given the guy's 55 years old, but or whatever it is. But, but hey, anyhow, we'll talk to you all in a few days on with the Jeff Jarrett podcast. We 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 need a sign off. That's what we need. We need to come up with a sign off. We'll figure it out. Today's not that day. The outro. Yeah, we need that outro. Right, and and don't forget to edit in the the intro, the elite Mark Order thing that I worked really yeah. hard on. Yeah, she did. I can't. I gotta find that. I gotta dig it up. I know I have it. If you need me to, I'll send you another copy. I love that thing. I think the Elite Mark Order sounds perfect. Can you get away with any bumper music on YouTube, or are they just gonna like? Uh, I wouldn't like, use any music? music. What were you thinking of using? Like Wayward Son? <laughs> I mean, just like I mean, even like Brian Alvarez will, will has have, have some bumper music on his shows, but it's like a real short clip that just fades out real fast. And I think it's short enough where you don't get flagged. Mm, uh, it's, it's, there's enough in the YouTube studio that we could make something work. We can talk about this offline. Okay. Let me, let me go uh, ahead and stop recording, by the way. Uh, hey, just before you do, I just wanted to say one more thing. Um, because we, you know, we wouldn't want um, all of our revenue to be stolen by, by Kansas because right. we had a few months away or so. That would be a lot of money that, that they would take from us. So. It's true. It's true. Our revenue stream is massive right now. It is. It is. Okay. So we got to come up with the Elite Mark Order sign off. That'll be soon. Today's not that day. Recording is over. <laughs>